Welcome to another session and thank you very much for um, preparing all of this, Ben. <laughs> um, so yeah, today's session is on power supplies and anyone involved in electronics will understand that chances are the thing that fails will be a power supply. Um, so there's a whole bunch of uh, mitigating um, things that we can do, I guess. Um, you look at, say, the modulators, KTFX commercial modulators, they run on two power supplies. So you have a redundant power supply because they know the, yeah, the problems, chances are going to be a power supply. So they have two, one dies, the other one takes over. Getting a good quality power supply is uh, imperative. And we very much focus on getting the right power supplies because we know that the equipment that it's connected to is probably a lot more expensive than the power supply itself. So you get the power supply right and, and the rest should be, should be hunky-dory. Understanding power supplies is also an important factor in, in knowing what to use and what to look for as a manufacturer. So I could hear Ben having a chat to our tech and some of our international guys. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot to it. And this session, we just want to explain some of the things that we do. As well as that, I guess, we've got plug packs and we've also got some bench top power supplies which are popular around the universities and stuff. So Ben's gonna run, uh, run over that too. Without further ado, Pass it across to Ben. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. Um, I'm Ben Marshall, for all of those who don't know me, and I, for whatever reason, am our resident geek and product expert. So today I get to talk to you about sort of one of the most essential things we deal with all day, every day, and don't think about it for longer than about three seconds. Um, when you go home and plug your phone in to charge it up, you know, that's a power supply that's done that job for you. Where did that power supply come from? Chances are if you work for us, you've bought it from us and are using that one and we know it works really well. Um, I have bought very cheap rubbish stuff out of, insert name here, com uh, country or another company or whatever else for it. And there's always that feeling of what on earth am I actually getting here? Is this going to charge my phone or is it going to explode in front of me? So. Um, will it burn the house down if I leave my iPad on charge all night? Well, there's some people who have had that experience with power supplies. There's a cases in Queensland just a few years ago where literally was an iPad in the family home plugged into a little USB power supply um, wall wart thing and burnt out, started burning the wall down and all sorts of other problems came out from it. So it's one of those things I want you to it might not be the most exciting thing in the world, but it's something I want you to start considering a little bit more when you, you know, plug anything in anywhere and, and see what's going on. Um, as Mike said, our tech, Nian, ran through a fair few things with me on these, and he also kindly disassembled a whole heap of power supplies that he had so he can have a look at what's actually on the board and what components go into it. Um, we've got our range that Mike's been talking about before, and I'll go through some of those bits and pieces later, but. I have to start with some more of the basics of what power supplies are, the type of circuit elements and things like that for it. So I'm going to get into a little bit of ACDC and a little bit of circuit theory. So unfortunately, that's about the most exciting ACDC that we're going to have around. So that one's got to go away. Um, this is what we're actually talking about. So power supplies, uh, when you've got something that's coming out of the wall here, it's rated at 240 volts AC. That means it's got a 240 volt peak followed by a 240 volt trough with null points in between. This voltage goes up and down and up and down 50 times per second. That's our 50 hertz that comes out of the wall here in Australia. Anybody know what it is for the US? 60. 60 hertz, exactly. What happens if you plug a 50 hertz capable thing into a 60 hertz socket or a 60 into a 50 hertz one? Depends what it is. In a lot of cases, it won't make a lot of difference. But if it's something like a motor, for example, a motor that's designed to run at 60 hertz and take power 60 times a second, you've now put 50 times per second into it. It's getting about 12, uh, sorry, about 20% less power coming through it. So something like a electric shaver or a little generator or something else like that might not be producing the power or the speed or anything else that you're looking for. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we sell a lot of step downs. People buy something from Japan, the US or whatever else it is. They plug it in and it still doesn't perform the way they want to. It's because they don't understand that 50 to 60 hertz thing. Um, I think we've asked Tortec probably five or six times a year about what it would cost to put a, uh, a frequency rebuilder in there. Essentially what you have to do is take the wall power supply, convert it down to DC, build, rebuild it, back up to AC and introduce a new frequency clock to it. It's 
super expensive. And if you just want to run your Kenwood you know, multi-mixer, then this is probably not the most useful thing to do. Um, in, the, yeah, in the opposite, well, no, in an alternative theory, you've also got a thing called direct current. And direct current basically says, I'm going to give you a voltage and a ground. That's what it is. And the power just goes one way for it. Um, when I was doing power theory in university, they tended to talk about it like water through a pipe or um, balls in a tube and other things like that for it to show how all this stuff worked. Um, if you think about it in a water sense, the easiest way for direct current to look like is I've got a bucket and I put a hole in the bucket and water comes out. That's direct current. It's coming in one direction. It's a pressure based on the size of the hole or the pipe that I'm feeding it through. That's basically it. If you're looking at something more like AC power, where we've got something that's pushing water into a circuit and pulling it out at the same time. So it's going one way, then it's circling back the other way, and it's just continually going backwards and forwards through it. So it's a bit of an odd situation for water, but it works really well for here. And these are the most common ways you see this labeled. So DC power supply for this one, an AC power supply for this one. Just an idea of what the waveform for the actual power looks like. Um, 240 volt out of the wall, single phase. So we only have one of those things going on. What happens if you've got a big arc welder, MIG welder, um, big uh, three phase motor or something else like that in an industrial plant? They use a different type of voltage called uh, 415 volt or three phase power. What about the stuff at the transformer in the street or the one at the big, um, big commercial line, uh, sorry, the big, um, name's gone out of my head. The ones that are coming over, yeah, substations and from the substations through the power pylons out to the generating ones and the rest of it. They run higher voltages again, 11,000 volts or more, depending on what they're trying to do. And they run three phase typically to make that sort of thing happen. Um, I'll go a little bit into some of that a little bit later, but I don't want to go too crazy. While I'm talking circuits, need to look at the basic components for it. I know most of you got some background in it, but just needs to be said. Looking at a resistor, this is something that sits in a circuit, drops the voltage, uses up a bit of the heat, you know, what, oh, produces a little bit of heat on the circuit and the rest. Anybody know what the difference are between these two, rather than the ratings themselves? Anybody recognize them from old circuit work days? So carbon film and metal film resistors. Um, I have a personal preference for carbon film ones because I find it a lot easier to see what's red, gold, brown, and the rest on that sort of beigey, horrible Telstra color than on blue, where brown and red and orange all tend to look a little bit similar. So if you're trying to do, uh, trying to work out what they are by the color codes, it makes it a bit tricky. Uh, a capacitor in a circuit, something that can smooth out a bit of voltage ripple, but it also comes in a range of different sizes and shapes, and it stores a little bit of energy as it goes. So the power comes into it and releases out. You know, depending on the circuit and how it's built and designed. Uh, inductors are basically just coils. So we've got a bit of wire coming in one side, it's wound around a whole heap of times and then out the other side for it. The transformer is sort of my favorite of these in a basic sense because it uses some really, really cool physics to make it work. You have a coil like you do with an inductor and another coil on this side. So you've got uh, 10 turns this side and you've got 20 turns this side. If you feed a voltage, an AC voltage through one side of it and you put a meter onto the other side of it, go from 10 turns to 20 turns, what happens to the voltage on the other side? Drops. Drops or increases or what do you reckon? It's normally in the ratio of the number of turns to one another. So if it's one to two, you're stepping up the voltage for it. If you're going the other way, then it's halving to go down. So it's a really cool way of taking like two bits, two coils together and off they go. There are different styles and EI transformers and toroidal transformers and other ways of building the same sort of idea. But in essence, the purest form of it is literally two coils sitting that aren't even connected to each other. And they couple each other through electromagnetic fields, which is really, really cool stuff. Um, diodes are obviously one of the most useful ones that we deal with all day, every day. LED stands for? light emitting diode. So they've got little uh, silicon junctions, or MPNs or whatever, junctions inside here. When this is given the right voltage, they produce light, very simply. Some of these other ones that are here are more like single direction diodes. So if you feed power in in one way, it lets the power in, but if you try and feed it back the other way, it stops. 
simple as that. There are things like rectifiers. These, in most cases, are diodes in their own way, just multiples of them put in. So I can feed in AC to one side and get DC out the other side of it. So a rectifier works really, really simply that way. Well, not technically DC, but we'll get to that too. Integrated circuits. These are little chips that have got pre-programmed, not instructions, but little wires built onto the board inside, maybe different lengths and things to make them work properly. You feed them something in, might be voltage plus a pulsing signal, and on the other side you get a result out of it or an ultimate little black box component in a circuit. And they're the thing that tell a circuit what to do in a lot of cases. Uh, fuses, we've obviously seen lots and lots and lots of them. Glass fuses, yeah, automotive fuses, more glass, some over here that are split fuses, and then a whole heap of ones across the bottom that look more like multimeter fuses. Um, we sell a fair number of um, ceramic fuses here. Um, particularly for things like high temperature applications or places where we don't want glass to shatter and break on a circuit for it. Do you know what a ceramic fuse is filled with? Anybody ever broken one open? They're actually filled with sand most of the time. So yeah, just a weird little factor. If you've got one that's, you know, somebody's returned or that Nian's got sitting aside somewhere, take a pair of you know, grips to it and rip the end off and pour it out. You'll find all these little tiny grains of sand going through the middle of it too. So yeah, anyway, just a little odd one. Uh, thermistors, obviously another important part of a circuit. Anybody know what a thermistor does? It absorbs power. It does, yep, up to a point. <laughs> Eventually they will uh, have some problems as well. They can in some cases be called thermal fuses or thermal cutoffs and other things like that as well. But yeah, they're a good way of, uh, of reducing the power that you don't need in the circuit and rectifiers and so on. Right, AC versus DC, benefits and drawbacks. Um, the simplest thing I guess is AC is a circuit that doesn't lose voltage over distance, not very easily. So when we're running our houses, we run 240 volts rather than running 12 volts in most cases. Um, 12 volts, if I had solar panels on the roof and all of my stuff inside ran on 12 volts, I could get away with it, but I'd probably have a lot of losses depending on the thickness of my cable and other stuff that goes on. Does anybody know why the thickness of the cable makes a big difference when it comes to DC versus anything else? the resistance of the cable itself. So the higher the resistance of the cable, the more losses you're going to get through, you know, through it. Heavier duty cage, gauge cables and the rest of it are going to be able to transfer more of the signal correctly from one end to the other. That's why we use heavier duty stuff when we run at longer distances, simple as that. Um, with AC though, I run a 240 volt house for it and as long as I use the right sort of flex and that I'm licensed to run 240 volt around my house, the voltage drop and the ripple, uh, sorry, the voltage across it all is pretty small. You know, 20, 50 metres throughout a house and I'm running back to a single switchboard, that all works out pretty well. If I'm running from one house to another one, I mean, 20 metre extension cable, I'm still going to get 240 volt out the other side of it. When I run from there out to our transformer on the street, we're still running 240 volt for it and that might be a 50, 60 metre run as well. But now I'm running from my house to the next one or my house to the substation that might be several streets away for it. I step up the voltage or step down to get to your street voltage and they run it higher again to reduce the amount of losses for it. So it works out pretty easily and pretty well. Um, very simple case that we deal with every day here that is looking at, DC, well, basically looking at losses through cable. Uh, different area of the showroom altogether is in our audio space. When we're running audio cable a long distance, an audio signal like a speaker line signal, we run 25 volts through it, generally as a sort of a peak level signal or thereabouts. And if I run that over five meters of cable, that's pretty heavy duty, it's okay. If I run it over 10 meters, 15, it's starting to have problems 20 meters and beyond. We're losing so much of the signal that the speaker might not even fire up and might not do its job. So in our showroom, we've got a whole heap of speakers in the ceiling running back to a central amplifier. They're all run, by my training earlier this year, a 100 volt line instead. So we step the voltage up a lot higher, put transformers onto the speaker that transform that back down to the lower voltage and impedance that the speakers actually drive with. 
And because I'm running that high voltage through it, I can run it through shoestring cable over 100 meters plus, and it will work really, really well. Uh, we've done the calculations uh, a few years ago, and they're actually in our knowledge base on the website. So if you get people asking how far you can run a 100 volt line cable that's 20 gauge, that's 18 gauge, or whatever it is, all the details and distances are on there. But chances are you'll be able to do it even with the crappiest horrible cable that you actually have. All right, in the rest of these, DC is obviously very common for small electronics. That's simple enough to understand. If I'm charging up my phone, I'm not gonna put 240 volts into the contacts on my phone because it might have a bad day. Um, DC though, charges up the batteries that are on the circuit. Batteries are DC based, so it's easy. DC in, change it to the right voltage inside the unit, uh, power up the battery, you know, the supply inside and off you go. Pretty simple to run with. With AC, motors love AC because motors running backwards are generators and generators running forwards are motors. So, or the other way around. So you put an AC signal into it and you generate turn, you generate power, you generate work and so it can do a job. DC motors still exist out there but they have a pretty clever way of um, almost slipping the contacts so you get bit of DC, bit of DC, bit of DC, bit of DC as it goes around to make it work. Uh, AC is really easy to convert. I'm down with the transformers that we talked about before um, and it pushes power so in a practical sense in the showroom if you're going to supply an AC power supply to somebody say one of these ones this is 12 volts 500 milliamps for it if I put this onto a circuit that could only take 250 milliamps what happens to it who knows but it will get exciting if there's a fuse on the circuit it's probably going to blow this thing will keep pushing out that 12 volt 500 milliamp even if the circuit doesn't want it so be very very careful when you're specifying AC power supplies for customers get exactly the right one and you'll be laughing some circuits are designed to cope with a certain amount of variation. So this is our standard alarm panel power supply, the 16 volts AC at one and a half milliamps. This, on, in a lot of cases, will work on 15 volt AC panels or 17 and a half volt AC panels. It's enough to do their job based on the way their circuits are designed. But I'd be very careful with just about anything else. Contrast that with DC. So if I have my little DC power supply here, this is, what's this one? 12 volts, 250 milliamps. Okay, if I plug this into a circuit that wants 100 milliamps, is the, at 12 volts, is the device happy or is it sad? Happy, happy. it works. It'll just pull as, the device will pull as much power as it wants and it will work for you without too much trouble. So to give you a concrete example, this is gonna be a bit ugly because the way this works, I've got, a little USB uh, display. So this will tell you what voltage and current flow a connected device is looking for. So if I connect that into my little wireless headphones, connect that into here, plug this into, let's go for uh, probably this one, I think. So this is the little SM524. So it's a 2.4 amp capable five volt supply. These headphones probably aren't gonna take 2.4 volts worth of, uh, 2.4 amps worth of current that goes into it. So let's see how it goes. If I plug this in, and this is gonna be upside down, so bear with me. I've got my little display up on there. And so for anybody in the front row, you can kind of see it's pulling about 400 milliamps worth of current out of the supply. Supply is happy. My headphones are happy, they're charging up the way they're supposed to. Everything's doing what it's supposed to do, which is rather nice. So I can oversupply current with one of these. Like if I really wanted to, uh, here are a couple of industrial power supplies. The one at the bottom here, I think has a five volt direct out. No, top one here has a five volt direct output up to 500 milliamps. But I could dial this one down all the way to five volts on its main output and put 15 amps worth of current potentially out through this power supply and my headphones would still charge and they'd still work. So you don't have to be as careful when it comes to that side of things as you do for AC. Does that make sense? Easy enough? Um, okay, DC side, match voltage exceed current. Circuits are pretty simple when you're dealing with this sort of stuff. DC circuits, resistors, caps and everything else works in a pretty simple way. 
AC circuits are a little bit more complicated in the way they have to be designed and built together to make it work. And obviously batteries love DC because battery is an ultimate DC power supply itself. Simple enough. Um, I talk a lot about power lines. So, you know, part of what I did at uni was power engineering. And you look at power stations like Loyang or you look at huge industrial power, um, you know, power generation in other countries around the world for it. And almost everywhere, with some few exceptions, they use AC to distribute the power. There are, though, ways of doing it, and we have one pretty close to home here. It's called high voltage DC. Um, I think it was a Swiss guy that invented it in the first place, and it's actually used quite a lot for underwater or submarine cables and power distribution around Europe, so underneath lakes and across the Mediterranean and a few other places. But the one that's in Tassie is sort of one of the big success stories, up until a couple of years ago where they had some major damage to it and it knocked out uh, basically all the internet to Tasmania for very most of the internet for a while and there are very few ships around the world and engineers who know how to work on this stuff so I think it took four months to get the ship from the other side of the world to bring this well to stop doing what it was doing to come to here to bring this thing up from the bottom of the ocean fix it and then drop it back down again it's not quite as simple as putting a solder sleeve on it or a terminal strip and then you know, twisting the ends together um, it's 290 kilometres from Agorans Beach down to Four Mile Bluff, which is where that submarine cable goes. Um, it's a 500 megawatt power link, and it's bi-directional. So the point of that is, Tassie's got a huge amount of renewable energy, and they're very good at doing it. Hydro in particular is fantastic. If we need more load over here in, a, in mainland Australia, I was about to say Australia, um, if we need power in Australia, we take it away from Tassie. And if they need from the coal-fired power stations, they can pull power down towards them. It's a really good way of coping with load conditions for it. It has one other huge benefit in that if you've got two big AC states like South Australia and Victoria, for example, those networks are coupled together in an AC sense. But if something goes wrong here, that can take out a lot of the network next door in the next state or next region or next area. A DC link like this one doesn't work that way. It's more something that can be separated and disconnected and taken away from service. What an AC cable to do this sort of job would get out of it is obviously the lower losses that we're talking about before, but it's very expensive to build a submarine multi-phase cable because of the way the surface uh, skin effects and other things go with it. So it's a super expensive cable. The hardware at the ends is pretty cheap, but the cable's really, really expensive. With this, this is really simple. You know, it's literally a couple of giant bits of copper running through, you know, through insulation and shielding with some telecoms cables around the outside so that internet and fiber and everything else can go through it. Very, very cheap here. More expensive here and here to make sure that the current's going right and the rest. And this is something that wouldn't have been possible without the semiconductors in about the 60s and 70s that came through. So these sort of connections probably won't be the most common ones in the world, but in theory, I could put this from Gippsland to Melbourne to transfer the voltage across as well. It would also work that way. Anybody see what the big drama with these ones would probably be? Big DC line that's losing voltage or losing power the whole way along. It's heat, simple as that. But we've put it underwater, a long way underwater. Water's pretty good at reducing heat, so it's not too bad. Um, and yeah, one end doesn't rely on the other one. And this operates at 400 kilovolts DC. So not 11 kilovolts like your substation stuff. This is good fun. This is not something you're gonna get out of a standard power supply. Okay. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm still yet to hear what the damage was that actually dropped out the link that was in there, but I'm guessing something to do with environmental damage. But in theory, if somebody dropped an anchor onto it and tried to, you know, tried to tow it away, I mean, I was talking to one of the installers who deals with Optus Towers and Telstra Towers and a whole heap of other ones, and apparently there's a bit of a spate of people hooking up the ute to the power cable that runs under the ground and just driving away, you know, pulling all the copper cabling out behind them. So, yeah, the people are desperate enough to do it if they really want to. Um, okay, very, 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 very quickly stuff through this because it's part of the circuits and the rest too. 
Everybody's heard of Ohm's law probably. Um, Ohm Georg or George or whatever you want to call, German physicist and uh, very smart guy came up with this basic relationship between voltage, resistance and current. The reason I bring it up is because this is something we have to do and calculate on the fly all the time. So if I take my little supply here before, my SM524, the five part of it is five volts, 2.4 is my amperage. So what is the wattage, the power that this thing can produce at its maximum? 2.4 times five, anybody do that maths in their head? 12. It's a 12 watt power supply for it. So voltage equals IR. In this case, we're looking at power equals voltage times current. It's a pretty simple relationship for it. If you have two of those parts, you can find out the other one. So if you have something like a bar heater that uses 2400 watts, for example, and we know our wall voltage is 240 volts, how much current is it doing? 2400 divided by 240 is 10 amps, roughly. So what are your circuits in the wall rated to? A lot of them probably only to 10 amps. That's why most of those bar heaters max out at 2400 watts. If you deal with a UPS, an industrial one that uses, that can produce up to 3000 watts or 3000 VA worth of you know, power for something, will, can I plug it into a normal wall outlet and make it work? Probably not. Most of those ones have 15 amp circuits for it. And if you start getting up into the bigger and bigger ones, 5,000, 7,500 and so on, they actually have to be hardwired specifically into the unit itself, requiring an electrician to actually do the commissioning and the work on it too. So UPS is the one that we come across a lot with this, but you can also do it for things like speaker cables and power ratings and all that sort of stuff too. So it's useful to think about. When I think about the power supplies that we deal with in our factory and the way they do things, they will often build a design, a case, a size like this one, and then custom, then build it out to a certain amount of wattage. So IEC socket on the side, DC plug on the other end for it. So this is a switch mode DC power supply. This thing is, what's this one? 12 volts, 500 milliamps, so it's a 60 watt power supply. So anything within 60 watts, you can basically build into this circuit. So if we wanted a one volt, 60 amp power output for it, in theory, we could make it happen or any other variation thereof. So if you've got a customer that needs 23 and a half volts at, you know, two amps, for example, this, these guys could make a version that makes that happen. Just requires enough quantity and that they don't have to do any really crazy engineering. The one volt 60 amp one would probably cause some issues, but yeah. It certainly can be done. So keep that in mind when you're talking to your customers. I know Mark's done it a fair few times. Um, we've done it for a whole heap of different customers along the way. If somebody comes into the showroom and asks for 10 power supplies, that's a good chance to start talking to them to say, what are you actually using them for? Where are these going? Are they replacements for this or that? Are you trying to make something work you know, with this rather than get exactly what you're looking for? Because we get, you know, We'll get the biggest companies that come in here to buy 10 power supplies and they could buy 500 that are specially done for what they're trying to do. Saves their guys a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of hassles just to have their particular component. And we've got a lot of those in our range now. Um, we just rely on you guys to tell us when that happens. So ask us and make sure that we know. Minimum order quantity for them is normally in the order of 500 pieces, I think. But we can always ask and find out. All right. Um, and it doesn't cost us any extra to make that happen. Power, power supply factory is perfectly happy to build that sort of quantity for it. So just might take a couple of months. Um, okay, so voltage, resistance and so on, all easy enough to do. The other one that comes up a lot, mainly because of noise, is Faraday. Uh, Maxwell's equation and all that sort of stuff as well. Uh, current in a wire creates a magnetic field around that wire. If you put a wire into a magnetic field and you, can, yeah, and you can create current in that wire for it. So if I have a, something like this power, you know, with power coming through it, if I've got the right type of current going through here, then I'm producing a magnetic field around the outside of this cable. If that's close enough to another bit of wire, so I'm running this right alongside that one for it, this one doesn't even have to be on, this one can be, and I'm picking up and creating voltage in this circuit to make that happen at the same time. You see this a lot where things create noise. So the old school LED transformers and downlight transformers and things like that were big culprits of it. 
They produced a lot of switching modes, you know, high frequency noise that got, and EMF, that, oh, EMI in this case. And so you get speakers that hum and buzz or, you know, TV amplifiers that die or, you know, a TV signal that's rubbish just because of the power cabling from something else. This is the reason why you don't run power, 240 volt power cables in parallel with your data cables, for example, or in parallel with your speaker wire. If you run them parallel, far more chance of something happening. If you cross it at 90 degrees, the chances are basically nothing. Um, the, the relationship between them is inversely proportional to the square of the distance, too. And the short version of that is the further they are apart, the less chance you are of something happening to it, too. So 30 centimetres, probably a minimum distance. 50 or 60, you're probably not going to get much current through in a domestic situation. Industrial stuff, very different thing. Um, my grandfather, in a similar vein, he used to live under power lines uh, near a railway... Uh, and radio antenna station up in New South Wales. And his party trick was taking a fluorescent tube up and standing outside, not connected to anything, just the tube, putting it in the air and it would light up because of the amount of uh, EMF or EMI that's coming off the power lines 100 metres above him. So yeah, that was, uh, was always a good sign. When we went back there a few years ago to take photos of my dad's childhood home and found out it's 100 metres behind security fencing that has danger high levels of radiation inside, that's, uh, yeah, that's always slightly worrying too. But it was a good party trick when, when you used to be able to do it. Okay, the other, I guess this is really nerdy stuff, but linear versus switch mode power supplies. We still get people asking for it. There are very specific reasons why you want them and switch mode power supplies are what we're stuck with most of the case, you know, most of the time. So a basic linear power supply. So we've got 240 volts out of the wall. This goes through one of my lovely transformers. So it takes it from 240, let's say, down to 12 volts on the other side of here. Now my 240 volt gets through a bridge rectifier here. So as the signal goes through looking like this, where you've got both up and down, it flips the stuff that goes down. So everything is positive now. There's still ripples up and down for it. So I put a filter on it. The filter, the capacitor takes a lot of that ripple out. And then I put this through a regulator that basically says what I want for my output and reduces the ripple even further and I get a DC output for it. The biggest drama with this is if I want to get this down to a usable power, that transformer has to be huge. And we're dealing with low frequency, like 50 hertz out of the wall, so the transformer is quite a big chunky one. So this isn't a linear power supply, this is an AC power supply instead, don't quite the same thing. But you pick one of these things up, so this is 12 volt, 500 milliamp. That is 12 volt, 250, did I put a small one? Oh, this will probably do. Yeah, actually that one. 12 volts, 0.8 of an amp. So Josh, if I give you those two, that one and that one, keeping in mind that the plastic case that we've taken off that one is you know, obviously weighing it. You know, can make it very light now. The big one, the AC one with the big transformer makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Huge, huge weight difference for it all. All right. So what I want you to think about when it comes to these is a linear power supply was big and chunky. They were also very, very, very inefficient. Um, I think some of the best ones you could get were around about 60 to 65 percent. Um, if you really designed it well, you might have been able to get up to 70, but that was about it. Mainly because the way that these transformers work, the capacitor and this regulator is the big part. If I want 12 volts out through my load that's here, and I've got, say, 17 volts in my ripple that's coming in, I'm losing 5 volts through that regulator. And that's just power that's got to go. It's just useless on the circuit. So that's a huge amount of loss. 17 to 12 volts on the output side, yeah, it's horrible stuff. Which is fine if you're dealing with, you know, uh, audio equipment, RF equipment like radios and so on. They love it because it's nice and clean power. Switch mode power supply is more complicated and because of this stuff and this, it can create a lot of noise, which is not so good in an audio world. So a switch mode power supply the incoming voltage goes through an EMI filter to reduce anything else that's going to cause problems and to try and stop RF from getting out. 
goes through a similar rectifier stage. So you still take AC and you flip it. So you've got AC, 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 all in positive. You put it through a filter. You're doing the same sort of thing you did before, but this is where it get changes. So in here is basically a switch that goes between full on and full off, essentially. And we switch that however many times per second we need to produce the output through the transformer that produces the voltage that we're looking for, all right? Complicated, there's more work in it and more than I'm gonna be able to cover today. But because we're doing this at a high frequency, so this could be in the megahertz range, so 10,000, 100,000 you know, hertz more, these transformers can be absolutely tiny. So that one was 12 volts, half, a, half an amp. Where's my, yeah, so this is 24 volts, two amps. So 12 volts, half an amp is about six watts. This thing's capable of 48 watts. And yet, if you put these things alongside each other, I'm not sure you get much of a difference in terms of weight between the two. And the transformer that's inside is that tiny little box there on the board. Little thing with yellow in it and plastic and a few bits of wire sticking out. That transformer is doing that job. And because we're doing it at high frequency, it can be that small. Look at some of these little cheapy ones, the tiny ones that are here and Look at that, it's a weeny little power, you know, little transformer. This is still taking wall power, 240 volts out of the wall, and through all of this ends up with this tiny little cable and the DC that we need to power our phone or you know, LED light or whatever else it might be. That's the huge benefit for these as far as that goes. And the efficiency of these circuits is so much better than it was before. Um, and they're the only way that we're allowed to actually sell power supplies in a lot of cases, in these sort of style anyway. Um, I didn't want to go into this too much, but there is a difference between root mean squared power and peak power. Um, anybody who's done car audio or quoted an, an amplifier system will know this. 2000 watts PMPO, 20 watts RMS is about this, you know, the way that these things are measured and looked at. Um, a peak power is something that you obviously you get your 240 volts that's here, let's say. Your RMS is more the useful power because that's where the circuit spends more of its time. There's less time up in this little section than there is in everything else that's on the circuit. So it's the usable power that we're working out. And just going back to my linear versus SMPS switch mode power supplies, heavy with big transformers, light transformers. Low efficiency, high efficiency. More reliable, that's debatable. But an AC circuit, oh, sorry, linear circuit is quite simple. There aren't a lot of components to it. So providing they're decent, it just works and keeps on working. Switch mode, as you know, we all know, are less reliable based on what goes into them. So this is kind of where I normally pull these things out and get you to have a bit of a look at what's on the board. So these two, 12 volts, one amp, 12 volt, 0.8 of an amp. Okay, so I'll give you two different power supplies. You want to pass them around and have a quick look at them and see what you can see. See what looks different, see the board types and everything else like that for it. If I go over to my, uh, this one, should be able to show you a couple of these as we go through. Uh, that's one of them. That's the other one there that we're looking at on the board for it. So these two are essentially the same type of power supply. They produce the same sort of DC output. They're just slightly different design. So you can see that on one of them, the transformer is slightly larger. It's probably got more you know, copper in it to make it a little bit more reliable, a little bit more solid. You've got two green Capacitors on the far end, these are much better capacitors, much higher efficiency ones. You've got a little fuse that you can see on the board here. Your bridge rectifier is four little individual diodes from this. A couple of decent sized caps, there's an inductor on the back, there's a cap across the power supply and a few other components there, but they all look pretty reasonable. If I switch across to my other one, there's a lot more space on that board. There's a lot less going on. The transformer that's in here will still do some of the same job, but it might not be as well made. The copper might not be as high a quality and there might not be as many sort of tight turns on it when it's made. Got one cap on the output board, the other one had two. This is green, but the other one was nicer. You've got a fuse on here, so 
equivalent in that sense, except as a different type of fuse. And you've got one little thing up on the board here that if I bring your attention back to the other one, it doesn't have. Now that isn't a transformer, although it kind of looks like one, it's an inductor. And the inductor is part of the EMI, the filtering circuit for it. So one of these power supplies has it, the other one doesn't. So which of these is potentially going to produce more noise or have more issues? Unfortunately, the bigger, heavier duty looking one without it is probably going to have more of an issue than the other one does. But the rest of the components on the board might mean that this one lasts less time than the other one does. Okay, so even small differences like that make a huge difference in the way the circuit works. These are my other two sort of big chunky examples. They're not rated exactly the same. One's actually 12 volts and the other one is 24. But big difference you can see to start off with is this wire hanging out over the top. Anybody work out why that might be? Correct, it's an earth cable running from one side of the board to the other side of the board because this is actually an earth power supply. This one's just a figure eight, so it has no earth. Simple enough. Um, the boards themselves, you can see there are slots cut out of them in strategic places. The idea being, you don't want voltage to go where it doesn't need to be. So if you cut the board physically, you create an air gap in there and so the voltage is far less likely to spike across or cause any other issues for it. Each of these has got your input side, so your 240 volt side down the bottom here. You've got a separation through here to keep that from the DC output side as well. Also again for things like noise and for coupling the circuits together. If you look at the boards themselves, actually both of these are pretty decent. You can see the same uh, RF, you can still, still see the same filters and things that it did on the others. I'll hand those out to have a look. And you can see that the components on the boards themselves actually look pretty similar in similar locations, similar sort of styles and quantities and all that sort of thing for it. And I definitely advise you to come up and have a look at some of the other ones that are up here as well. But I've got one more little one to show you as sort of the worst example of its kind, which should be this one. Okay, so this is a horrible little power supply, but it works. So how horrible is it? Number one thing is for me, the AC input cables are really brittle. And the way that this thing has to be put together means you kind of have to fold one cable in here and fold the other one through these slots they've dug out of the board and then kind of press it in so the cables are catching potentially on the top of it. So if the ma manufacturer was a little bit fast or sloppy or something else happened, you could quite easily catch that cable in the top there and start stripping it out. And then you've got 240 volt live on the board in a place where it's probably not supposed to be. These are dis double insulated, but that's not really how that's supposed to work. Uh, this one has got little bridge rectifier, you know, individual diodes to make that work. It's got a fuse, it's got thermal protection, it's got an NTC in there as well, a couple of caps, no EMI filter, so it's going to be noisy. A couple of little caps there and some pretty low, you know, very cheap output caps on the output end for this all, all as well. And my little output cable is soldered-ish to the board with some extremely lightweight, what would that be, 24 gauge cabling or something similar for it. This is a 5 volt, 1500 milliamp little circuit for it. So it's about seven and a half watts or so. This is being plugged into power in the wall the same time as all these other ones are. And if I cracked this thing open and had it at home, I would look at it and go, oh dear, that's, that's a bit worrisome. Um, and this comes packaged with a particular product that you know, sells all day, every day, everywhere. So when you're looking at power supplies, from the outside, you probably can't tell a lot from it. Sometimes the weight will tell you something. A better transformer, the shielding that's in those particularly will weigh more than a normal power supply will. The other side that you can't tell from here, but we can tell you from the back end side of it at least, it's how the factory actually handles their power supplies and how they handle the gear themselves. So with the DOS power supplies that we sell all day, every day, and tens of thousands of, 
every one of the components that goes onto the board, where's my DOS one? I think I handed it out, didn't I? This one. Yeah, so every single one of the components that's on the board that's in here is tested before it's put onto the board. You can see dots and things like that on it to show that they've actually tested these things. So when you're going through however many thousand of these you're making a day and you're testing every single capacitor, they have an entire department that checks capacitors. That's your job. All day, every day, testing the caps to make sure they perform the way that they're supposed to. Every other component on the board is tested the same way. That's why the fault rates for our power supplies are remarkably low and why we keep dealing with the same factories because we're always happy with them. They work. I put these into my home all day, every day. I haven't had my house burned down, so that's a good start. Um, the, yeah, the manufacturer is always happy to work with us. They do good work, so we'll keep buying from them. It's pretty simple as that. Um, and as I said earlier, if you want a custom version, just let us know. It will, we can certainly do it. If I jump back across to my presentation for a second, so the reliable part of this is down to the components that are on the board. Simpler circuit for the linear ones, more complicated here. The complicated one relies on each of its components working well. So good quality control, good quality brand makes a big difference for it. Linear supply doesn't make any, um, creates no RF interference. This one can. Immune to noise and EMI needs EMI filters built in. EMI stands for electromechanic, uh, electromagnetic interference. Sorry, brain had a weird moment. Will not pass MEPS and can pass different levels of MEPS. All right, so MEPS is something that Fung loves. Um, minimum energy performance standards. It's something the government has regulated for every single external power supply like this up to 250 watts in size. It means that these power supplies have to pass a certain set of standards, otherwise you can't sell them. All right, now there is a fun fact sheet that the government puts out for this. And so I'm gonna run through every single part of this with you because it's really exciting. No, I'm not boring as hell, but it's government standard. What do you expect? External power supplies are covered by energy efficiency regulations. If you import them, manufacture or sell products with them, you have to conform to these standards. Great. Rubbish, 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 rubbish. Different types of product classes. What products are not covered? Labor and requirements, families and models, yada, da, 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 and then you get to this. So this is probably the most important thing to look at. So I'm gonna go back to here where I've blown it up slightly. Over on the left-hand side, there are the marks. So these mark the different levels of MEPS performance that you can put onto your device. And each one of the ones that I handed out there, most of them had that mark on the back of them somewhere. It's always in Roman numerals, so yeah, III, IV, V, and VI, and eventually at some stage they might go to VII. Each, within these sections here, when the ore product is tested, if it conforms to, here we go, so zero to 250 watts, if it's say a 70 watt power supply and its efficiency is greater than or equal to 0.85 based on the formula, then it is a class four device, simple as that class five, class sixes, and so on. So keep an eye on it. That's why you can't sell linear power supplies anymore. And if anybody really wants to do the maths for it, they can, and I did it, and it kind of works, but it's the government, so it's based on natural logarithms and other things too. Okay, the hieroglyphics on power supplies. Um, these are some of the common things that you'll see on a power supply. Anybody know what the CE stands for? Or what it's useful for? what it means, Mike does, because he's done it many, many times. CE is tested to European standards. Great. What about UL? US standards, more or less. VDE and T of, well, T of V Rheinland, any guesses? German, European. This one? It's the BSI, the British Standards Institute, so for the UK. And that one, that's the Australian one, yes. What's that? That's the old Australian standard. That's called a CTIC. You might still get people asking about those. That doesn't matter anymore. They should have progressed onto the new ones for it. So some of the power supplies that we're handing around there uh, will have the old ones and the new ones for it. And I'll show you some images in a second to show that off. 
but the Australian tick is the one that we care the most about. Anything that we bring into Australia, we make sure it's got that tick and that it's capable of that tick and that it's registered and licensed and we have all the documentation because it's, yeah, not cheap to do, so we like to pr proudly promote the fact that we do. Okay, this is the other common symbol that you'll see. So this little thing is a representation of the outside of a, of a tip like this one. We've got positive on the inside and negative on the outside for it. And you could flip those things around. Can anybody tell me if you've ever seen that on an AC power supply? Or would you ever see it on an AC power supply probably? And, yeah, it's very much a trick question. Um, from what we were talking about AC before, the voltage flips all the time between positive and negative, and it flips on those wires between positive and negative as well. So there's no real need for it. You know, there's no center positive tip, you know, whatever. It is what it is. But this is very important on a DC circuit because if you feed positive voltage into a part of the circuit that's expecting negative or ground voltage, you're going to have a bad day a lot of times. So when your customers come in, make sure it's capable of it. And we do a lot with our power supplies to make sure that some of them have tips that are removable. So if you need to flip that over, you certainly can. On the outside of the of here, there's a little plus and there's a little minus. And on here, there is a tip or an arrow. And all you do is you match that up and say, right, plus equals arrow, therefore tip positive. Simple as that. Um, okay, other symbols that appear on it. Anybody guess about this one? Indoor. Indoor. Don't put it outside. What about this one? This is actually European more than it's Australian. Anybody got an idea? Don't throw it in the bin. There's a recycling program in the, uh, the EU for power supplies and electronic components and things like that. And that's what this is related to. Um, here in Australia, your local council has a certain amount of electronic waste recycling that they do. So you may be able to drop your power supplies off to them. And there's some valuable components on the board there. Quite a lot of copper, some, z you know, some zinc, some gold in some cases as well. So you know, they don't mind recycling it a lot of the times. In actual fact, Tokyo Olympics next year, all of the athletes' medals are made from recycled mobile phones. Golds and bronze, you know, everything else like that has come in from recycling phones. Part of it's because Japan's not a big place for mining in the first place. It doesn't have a lot of its own gold and silver and so on. But it's a good way of showing how good their environmental credentials are. This one, this one's a bit of an odd one. Double insulated, absolutely. Simple enough. And then this last one, you may have seen, you may have not seen. Anybody guess what that one's going to be? It's on this one, if that makes any difference. It means it's fused. So it could be a thermal fuse, could be a glass fuse, ceramic, whatever else it is, but it means it's actually a fused power supply. So uh, on a lot of the standard ones, you won't see it, but yeah, some of them that are up here certainly have that still on them. Uh, I will, yes, look, the important one, yay, Australian tip, okay. My last little thing I wanted to show you on these is if I'm looking through these power supplies and then go across to the images of there, yeah, that will go back to that one because that's the worst, I love that. All right, so a DOS power supply like this one, let's have a quick look at it in some more detail. So, center pin positive, out a negative, efficiency level V or five, got an Australian tick, designed to be used indoor, double insulated for it. Up the top, we have the model, we have the input voltage, so this will take anywhere from 100 to 240 volts at 50 or 60 hertz, up to 0.4 amps. So you could take this to America, the UK, Japan, wherever you want to, it will work if you change the pins over. The output is 12 volts, there's my little DC symbol before, 1000 milliamps, 12 watts. The approval number is there, everything else is there for it, and you can search and find those approval numbers online. So if you want to be doubly sure that you're buying something that's properly approved, you can find those. Here is a similar one. Again, efficiency 5, plus minus negative, yeah, Australian tick of approval doesn't actually give you the approval number anywhere on here. I don't think you actually have to, but if you went to try and find this model on the list, you would want to be sure that it was the exact same model. Um, there are a few 
uh, less than scrupulous people out there who will just register some and get some approved and then the other ones don't quite work that way. Again, same sort of inputs and outputs and things that you saw before. If I go to our switch mode one, you can see the same sort of thing. There's a little E here, but I'm gonna go back over to my, well, actually, these are all good ones to do. Same sort of thing. Now this has got the old C-Tick on it. It's an old power supply. You are allowed to sell old power supplies if you still have them, but if you're buying in any new ones, they've now gotta be that next approval mark instead. This one's got UL markings, so it's okay in the UK, uh, sorry, in the US as well. Got GS here, which I can't actually remember what that one is. Uh, TUV, which is the German or European one again. So I'm gonna guess that might be, could be Russian, could be Singapore, could be anything else like that as well. Same sort of things you looked at before, the double insulated or output voltage and pins and everything else are also on there. Simple enough. Here is my little cheap rubbishy one that I've been bagging out for most of the time. And, well, it's got an Australian tick on it. It's approved for Europe. It's approved for more of Europe as far as that's concerned. So in theory, it's fine and it works really well. Josh has still got it. Uh, this one, yeah, same sort of marks that it does. The FCC one that's on there is that it's been tested in the US to make sure it doesn't produce noise, an RF. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, go through these. And then let's look at this big bad boy. This is one that actually came with one of our products. Um, when it came over from the factory. It's 48 volts at five amps, which probably tell you it's for PoE, so it's a power supply for an NVR. 48 volts at five amps, that's nearly 250 watts worth of power. So this is about as big as those MEPS standards go for, but we've got a problem. And there's a reason why we ripped them all out and couldn't sell them. Um, that's, I think one of the Chinese ones, if I remember rightly, that's for Europe the house for indoor and oh dear where's the Australian marks it doesn't have them this isn't approved for Australian use so as soon as it came in the box we opened it up and went turf and off it goes this thing's huge too massive brick of a power supply but yeah useless in theory it could work and it would work fine plug it into the wall it would do exactly what you want it to do so if you buy a product from Gearbest or Alley or wherever else it is overseas, it comes in and you look at it and go, oh, it just doesn't have approvals. Yeah, I don't care. I'm gonna plug it in, I'm gonna use it anyway. That, if your insurance company finds out about it when your house burns down, is gonna be all up to you. So be very, very careful about what you do when it comes to approvals and power supplies and the rest. Now my, there are a lot more online if you want to find out more about some of the stuff that I've done. The top guy is fantastic. He pulls apart power supplies from like Poundland, one pound USB power supplies to 500 kilovolt components and everything else. He's done a lot over the years, so he's a very interesting guy. There's more on basic circuitry if you want to do it. And this guy is completely insane, but he's very fun to watch as well. So again, circuits and power supplies, you've got a lot more that you can cover and look through. To finish off then, I want to talk a little bit about Manson and Manson power supplies. So we've been talking mostly about the switch mode, small stuff. Manson deal with the next level up for the most part. And these sort of power supplies are the ones that you are going to want to use if you have a lab at home that you test things out on and play with all the time. If you've got a test bench like Nian does here, you need to be able to dial in different voltages and currents to make them work the way that you expect them to. So if you've got a power supply like this, for example, produce any voltage you want within a certain range, any current within a certain range, and work out how your circuit does its job. This one also has programming ability. So plug it in via USB to your computer, run some software, and then you can ramp the voltage up and down in a predictable pattern if you want to. You can change the currents on the fly, you can see what's going on for it. These sort of things are the ones that I used when I was in university. You know, when you've got a physics experiment and you need a specific voltage, they're not going to give you one of these and say, you know, go and plug it in and then plug this into your equipment and make it work. No, because we've got to deal with inaccuracies and error margins and everything else. So I plug this one in, I look at it and kind of go, right, plus or minus one of the smallest division, that's my error margin for this particular power supply that I'm using. I'm feeding 12 volts out to my circuit and I've dialed in 500 milliamps. 
it means there's no variation in whatever quality this might be. I've got a rock solid component that's on my board and Manson are absolutely brilliant at making these type of things. We sell a lot of you know, standard single voltage power supplies like these ones. This is a four amp, 13.8 uh, volts. This one I think is the 23 amp, 13.8 uh, volt lighter sockets on it. So you can use these to run things that normally run off cigarette lighters like you know, UHF radios, for example. So if you have, let's say, a caravan park and you have all of your staff have a handheld radio or a vehicle radio that they go out and around the park with, in the office, take one of the normal mobile you know, um, in-dash units, plug it into the power like this one, put an antenna on the outside of the building, and now you can talk from your base station out to everybody else that's there. And a good power supply will do that for you. These are more likely to be used in a lab situation where you need a narrow form factor one. You've got limited bench space or you might need to occasionally move it from spot to spot to make it work. Provide a predictable voltage and current to get a predictable result. With programming ones like these ones, there are obviously a lot more you know, fine tuning and dial adjustments you can do. This one, this one will even dial you down to the second level of you know, uh, voltage and current for these. So this can be very, very accurate. With a unit like this one, this is pretty common for a lot of backyarders because you've got 12 volt and five volt direct outputs off the front of this. So if you just want to fire up a little Raspberry Pi circuit or a you know, 12 volt circuit for a small electronic component, you just plug it straight into the front panel, off you go. And your main output terminals are on the front as well. So everything you need is close to hand. With some of the other ones, your main outputs are on the back of the unit. So this one, for example, on the front, we've got a five amp maximum output for it. If I want the real output though, it's sitting off the back with the heavier duty terminals on it. There are different modes that you can run this through and there are preset modes and recalls and the rest. Again, for unis and labs and the rest where you need to be able to pull up predictable results every time. You flick a button, press a button and say, that's my result today. This, because it has presets, you can see the voltage is varying up and down and the current's varying up and down that I've preset into this unit already. There's a USB port on the front panel, again for control. Very, very simple product. So I guess my final point with Manson stuff is these tend to be the last power supply that you buy. You buy one of these, put it onto your bench, put it onto your, into your lab, put it in your uni, whatever else it is. Uni's a special case because uni students destroy things. So chances are we'll keep selling them to universities, which is great for our business. But the backyarder might buy one of these power supplies and he'll, come, he'll replace the fuse that's in it very occasionally. And that's it, they will just keep on going. Really, really exceptional products and we sell a lot of them. We've got guys that use them for things like electroplating. So you need a particular voltage to do this type of material versus that type of material, this type of tub versus that type of tub, they use those power supplies to do it. Um, it makes it very, very easy to work with. So we do a lot with Manson and they have a lot of products that we don't necessarily cover here in Australia because they, we just might not have ever needed them. This one, I, I actually quite like the, uh, the controllers for things like cars in showrooms. So if you go around to the Renault showroom in Essendon, all of the cars have got their lights on all day, every day. And they've got their boots open. They've got all the other stuff, like the cars are live, you know, their batteries wouldn't last all that long if they kept doing it. And it's the same issues that we do if we leave the lights on and go into the shops for an hour and forget about it. So they use heavy duty power supplies like those to wire directly onto the car's battery or into the electronic system to keep it live for all that time that they need it to. There are linear power supplies that these guys make and they can do it because they're a self-contained unit rather than an external power supply like one of these little ones. So yes, lots of little toys, lots of solar stuff and other things for it all as well. And I highly recommend you make yourself familiar with the range that we do from 120 amp 13.8 volt supplies, all the way down to the little weenie switch modes, benchtop power supplies, solar regulators, lead acid battery controllers, power meters, really good little power meter up to 20 amps. So a normal multimeter will top out at about 10 amps. This will go all the way up to 20. 
And my actual favorite of their little products is this one. So this is an in-car power supply. Comes with, you know, cigarette lighter socket to plug into the side for this thing. Or you can hardwire it straight into the power in your car if you want to. This allows you to produce a whole range of different output voltages based on a little push button on the side. And there's a little DC jack out here that allows you to run to something like USB if you wanted to, although it has got a direct USB out. And you've got a little adapter cable here with a whole heap of different plug sizes and pins on it. So if you've got a specialized little bit of electronics that's in your car, that could be LED lighting that's under the dash, that could be a GPS unit that uses an unusual pin, you've got something else that's going on. This will get that for you and you'll see exactly what you're doing on the screen for it at all times too. They're a really useful little product and they're something we should be selling a fair few more of, but not a lot of people know that they even exist. They're definitely a step up from a standard cigarette lighter power supply in a car. All right, uh, let me see. That is probably it in a general sense, except to remind you that, yes, we custom make things. This is a power supply for a particular masthead amplifier. It needs 12 volts and it needs the little F-type injector put on the end of it. That's a DOS product. We've got hundreds of those in stock. And Bilgen's favorite product is at the front here, which is our new little Raspberry Pi 4 capable power supply. USB-C output on it. I think this is up to four amps, isn't it? No, three amps. Yeah, five volts at up to three amps. We've got power delivery USB type C connector. I think this is up to 18 watts. And my info panel is stuck under the thing. Uh, yeah, so five volts at three amps, nine volts at two amps, and 12 volts at one and a half amps for it. Fully approved, and it's a travel capable one. So take it to the US and plug it in and use it, or you've got the Australian adapter here, and we've got EU ones, and I think UK ones sitting out the back for it as well. Very good, I will leave you to have some fun. Do you have any questions for me about power supplies or ones that your customers have asked you in-house, out of house, anywhere else like that? I've just said, I mean, on some of the photos we could see. Um, yeah, on some of the photos we saw um, ITE, um, which is probably worth mentioning that, yeah, what's that, IT, information technology equipment. Yeah. Um, yeah, we need to especially make it for that. So just because you see a power supply with the right voltage and amperage, it doesn't mean that you should be plugging it into um, our kind of electronics. Yeah, that ITE. Yeah, definitely. That's actually something I didn't look into enough beforehand. So. Um, I assume it's just basically a higher standard of testing and calibration and whatever else for the units themselves. So yeah. I also didn't look into it, but yeah. I think it's to do with the filtering. So yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. I might have to do a bit more reading. There are obviously a lot of other things about power supplies that I don't know and a lot of other areas that I can't cover in one, one hour session. but. Come up, have a bit of a play, have a look at some of these boards, the ones you didn't see earlier, and if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you very much.